So good morning, everyone. And welcome to the Ford Foundation. I'm Darren Walker, and I have the great privilege of serving as president and welcoming you this morning. And this is a great day. I want to thank my former colleague, my beloved and adored former colleague, Roberta Uno, for her remarkable leadership. The idea of arts in a changing America is something that Roberta was preaching many, many years before these words appeared this morning. She stood for the idea at the Ford Foundation that we were being transformed by a world around us and that we here needed to get busy because that world was catching up with us. And Roberta, we miss you, but we know that you are doing remarkable work at CalArts. And of course, my friend Stephen Levine, it is always good to welcome you back to the Ford Foundation. I also want to introduce you to the new head of our Creativity and Free Expression program. Her name is Dr. Elizabeth Alexander. Please welcome Elizabeth Alexander. Many of you know Elizabeth Alexander as uh, a remarkable poet, writer, um, the uh, woman who delivered that uh, transfixing poem at the inauguration of her friend Barack Obama as president in 2009. And that was a memorable occasion, Elizabeth. And we are looking forward to you creating memories here at the Ford Foundation in the years ahead. So let me just start us off by saying, and by reminding uh, us all that the Ford Foundation has been an ardent supporter of the arts for over 60 years, because we believe that the arts are essential to achieving a fair and just and peaceful world. And of course, we know what the greatest threat to that idea of a just, fair, and peaceful world is. And we believe it is, in fact, inequality. And inequality, not just income inequality, but inequality in all of its forms. And amidst our current crisis on widening inequality, the arts have never been more important because while things are changing, one thing is constant. The arts matter more in our society than ever. And in 1956, when we embarked on the journey of expanding the Ford Foundation's mission to include the arts and humanities, our then Vice President McNeil Lowry said the following. The humanities and the arts exist not merely as an adornment to society, but as the repository of some of its most essential wisdom and of a good portion of its moral fiber. The arts cultivates empathy. The arts creates economies of empathy. And throughout our history, we have seen how cultural leaders and their radical ideas play a role in seeding and accelerating social movements and social change and social progress. And so as our society changes and our society becomes more diverse, so too must our arts. To reflect that essential wisdom that McNeil Lowry spoke of, to retain that moral fiber and to renew our empathy for one another. Because we cannot in America afford for the arts to be monochromatic, or just one note, or we cannot limit ourselves to one narrative, one story, or one kind of dance. Because before the voting booth, or the marriage license, or even the Oval Office, the experience of the arts helped change America. And so today, it's time again to talk about change. This program, Roberta, your imaginative creative program, puts into clear focus the ambition 
of this project that Roberta is leaving. And we could not be more excited to be here to cheer you on and support you on this important occasion. So with that, I believe it's time for you to hear from a person who is far more important than me and who has played a much greater role in making today happen, and that is my friend Stephen Levine, the president of the California Institute of the Arts. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. So proud of Thank you. you. Actually, be oh. before you step down, since Roberta's coming to us, I thought we ought to oh bring CalArts to you. Um, th this will help you when you're in the sun of California. Oh, <laughs> when I'm in this New York City, Southern California sun. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and a few other little items. Thank you. Lots of great tchotchkes. We love this here. <laughs> and I love the fact that it's a Cal Arts. Logo. Yay. <laughs> thank you, Stephen. You're very kind. Thank you. Roberta, thank you. So proud of you. I'm really delighted to be here today for the launch of Arts in a Changing America, and happier still that the California Institute of the Arts is going to be the home, primary home, there'll be additional home at NYU, um, for, this, for this project. Uh, you know, the, the multiplicity of media and information channels today uh, sometimes gives the impression that all information is available to all of us all the time. And perhaps it is if you can only find it, through all the noise and the marketing and the chatter. In many ways, however, that chatter is making it harder than ever for all but the most committed self-promoters uh, to be heard in the society generally. Remarkably, this is true even when it comes to the arts and cultural organizations and individual artists. Even though these organizations and individuals are almost by definition professional communicators, when I first moved to Los Angeles 27 years ago, the leaders of the Music Center of Los Angeles County, our Lincoln Center, uh, didn't know the leaders of the Plaza de la Raza, which was less than five miles away. In fact, you could see it from the roof of the Music Center. Uh, this wasn't a result of any ill will. Uh, it was rather that we all tend to operate in our own limited domains, working harder and harder to do what we do, and of course, it was also a result of inequality of resources, with those with sufficient financial support able to project their voices more loudly into the world uh, than the vast majority of individuals and organizations without those resources. This is true in Los Angeles, but it's also true in New York and in cities all over the country. Not being able to hear one another has always had negative consequences for our cities and our counties and our states and the nation. But at this moment, when the United States is undergoing profound demographic, this sounds so formal. I was just in a session that was so human and humane. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna go on doing it. Uh, only, only way for me to be brief is to actually have written it down. Um, you know, those of us who grew up in the university where you're taught in 50-minute units, it's really hard not to talk for 50 minutes uh, after a while. Anyway, uh, but at this moment when the United States is undergoing profound demographic shifts and when those shifts are taking place in a period of ever-increasing disparities of wealth and poverty, it means we cannot know who we are becoming as a nation and it means we are crippled in the effort to move forward together toward a more decent and humane future. CalArts uh, is dedicated to enabling talented students in all the arts to become articulate creators and responsible citizens. Again, that sounds awfully formal, but it's also true. Uh, we want them to have the tools to, to make their voices heard uh, and to project their visions into the world. For the past quarter century, we've been committed to enrolling students from a diverse array of communities such that our campus might actually be a microcosm for the United States and now increasingly for the world. This has meant creating award-winning youth programs that reach thousands of students across the Los Angeles basin, 
uh, from underserved communities. Equally, it's meant building a CalArts facility in the heart of the Music Center of Los Angeles, where we could prevent, present uh, voices and visions that otherwise can't have difficulty making it into the bigger halls of that, of that facility. Most important, by, by focusing on talent and promise, rather than on grades and test scores that chiefly reflect the realities of privilege and inequality, uh, we've grown to be one of the most diverse artistic communities in the United States, with 48% of our highly selective student body coming from communities of color, another 18% uh, internationally. I think that makes us the most diverse art school in the United States, certainly uh, private art school in the United States. Uh, despite the fact that we collaborate with arts and community organizations all over the Los Angeles Basin, it's hard to grasp, even in our home territory, uh, the full range of cultural practice in our region. Uh, just the other day, I attended the in, um, uh, a concert at the Indo-American Friendship Council and learned that there are 250,000 people of Indonesian descent living in Los Angeles who feel they can't be seen at all because the boxes and the census forms don't have a space that you could identify yourself as Indonesian in some way. And as, and as a result, they feel they have no identity in the larger community uh, and are working toward, except actually in the form of the gamelan at CalArts, uh, which was what was being celebrated at this event. Um, this is where arts in a changing America um, comes in. Um, Arts in a Changing America is a five-year project uh, to map what is happening as increasingly diverse populations bring an increasingly diverse range of artistic and cultural expression to every corner of the United States. It's an effort to identify the organizations and individuals who are speaking out about who they are and what they believe and who are both reinvigorating older cultural and institutional forms and creating new ones to open possibilities for self and group expression. It is, about, it is also about providing a platform for a diverse new generation of artists from uh, around the, the country to find one another, to make alliances among themselves, to gain the strength of having colleagueship across communities uh, and to increase their potential to um, change the way we think about who we are and what this America is. Um, that this is possible at all, uh, and I wish Darren were still here so I could thank him, really turns on uh, those 13 years that Roberta Uno uh, had the privilege of being at the Ford Foundation with this national and to some extent international purview of what was happening uh, in diverse arts organizations uh, around the United States. Uh, I don't think there's anyone better prepared uh, to take on this kind of um, difficult and extensive an initiative. Um, I just, most of you probably know this, but uh, before the Ford Foundation, she was the founder and artistic director of the New World Theater that for a long time, 1979 to 2002, uh, as well as being a professor of directing and dramaturgy. Uh, her books include The Color of Theater, uh, Race, Culture, and Contemporary Performance, uh, Unbroken Thread, plays by Asian women, and two volumes of monologues, uh, for actors of color, one for women and, and one for men. Um, it's difficult to imagine someone better prepared uh, to help us understand uh, who we are and what our country is becoming. And with that, I will turn the stage over to Roberta. Thank you so much. Welcome to the launch of Arts in a Changing America. <laughs> yeah. 
Bienvenidos a todos. Aloha mai kako. Mahalo to my wonderful friends in Hawaii for surprising me with these beautiful lei. Um, I, as you can see, I have been so privileged to work with two extraordinary leaders, and I really want to thank Stephen Levine and Darren Walker for their incredible support of the project, their faith in me, and um, their belief in you know, the, the social justice change we all want to see. Um, I also want to acknowledge Hillary Pennington, the vice president of the, what is it called now? Oh, Education, Creativity, and Free Expression Program. You know, a lot of names have changed, but that one stayed the same. Um, and I want to thank Margaret Morton and Dave Mazzoli and the incredible staff of that unit. Um, and a very, very special thanks to Maureen Knighton of the Nathan Cummings Foundation, Taryn Higashi of Unbound Philanthropy, Jason Smart and Diane Kaplan of the Rasmussen Foundation and our colleagues at the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. You are all visionary leaders uh, who inspire us to not just be strategic, but to also be fearless and passionate in our commitment to social change. I wanna thank you all for coming today um, from all corners of the country. As you know, the arts are in a time of extraordinary transformation. The arts are being re-energized by a wide range of aesthetics and languages, innovative networks, new technologies and modes of interdisciplinarity and cross-sector collaboration. And artists are moving between communities and the not-for-profit space and the for-profit space. There is a proliferation of emergent arts and hybrid organizations and transitions of leadership and a fresh generation that is really energizing um, our vision. And our country is transforming too. No other country's population has experienced such rapid and massive ethnic and racial change. So as Stephen said, Arts in a Changing America, or Art Change Us, is a five-year initiative that seeks to explore and understand the demographic transformation of the country through the lens of arts and culture. And I believe this is an urgent moment to center the arts at the intersection of arts and social justice. This is really a call for the arts to be at the center of creating a more just, fair, inclusive, diverse, forward-looking America that is part of a global community. So I just wanna go over quickly, and I hope I pushed the right button, um, what our goals are. Our goals are to reframe the national arts conversation at the intersection of arts and social justice and to elevate the cultural assets of demographic change. To catalyze and make visible relevant innovative art work and future thinking arts practice. To create opportunities for artists, organizers, and idea producers to connect across sectors in order to produce new collaborative possibilities and introduce new perspectives. And um, while we're doing this, we will actually enact our research. Um, you will not have to wait years for a report to be written. We are going to do our work through five national convenings that will circulate around the country. So right now we're starting in New York. And you know, this is really a, 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 an immersive kind of experience, a laboratory of, of thinking and also um, process. And they will bring together an exceptional mix of leading artists, scholars, activists, and change makers like yourselves. And we will collaborate to produce a series of smaller Art Change Us At events, which will occur at existing gatherings. So for example, um, you know, Jason Shupak from Our Town, NEA, just reached out to me. I've been in conversation with Jamie Bennett at Art Place. Um, you know, I see Lulani Arquedas here from the Native Arts and Culture Fund. So let's talk. We would love to collaborate, um, not just in the arts, but also outside of the arts. So for example, in December, we're collaborating with Fabiana Rodriguez and Culture Strike, as well as Tanu, at the National Immigration um, Integration Conference. We're going to program an unprecedented arts track and an immigrant artist caucus 
at what is the largest gathering of immigration rights activists and organizers and funders in the country. And lastly, we will build knowledge from artists and communities' perspectives. It's not enough to just lift up voices or even to create the space like this for the unexpected and necessary conversations we need to have. But we also need to create new canons. And I'm, I'm actually appreciative that you mentioned some of the books that, you know, I did them in the 90s and they're still in print because there has been more and more of a demand because the population has changed. So we have to create these new canons. Throughout the project, we'll do this through commissioned essays, through video interviews, and documentation on multiple platforms, but ultimately in published book form. So why are we doing this? It's a huge effort. Well, as we all know, we're all experiencing it. Demographers, demographers have projected by the year 2020, um, or as early as 2040 actually for the entire country, people of color in aggregate, blacks, Latinos, Asians, and Native Americans will eclipse the historic majority Caucasian population. And this flip will occur much earlier in 2020 for the children's, uh, nation's children under 18. According to Maria de Leon of the National Association of Latino Arts and Culture, every 40 seconds a young Latino turns 18. This change is rolling up from the next generation. 19 of 25 of the largest metropolitan areas in the United States have already shifted. Uh, major cities like this one, New York City, and entire states um, like California and Texas. Meanwhile, all these changes come at a time of post-recession scarcity and fierce competition as well as extreme political polarization and a punishing discourse about American cultural identity in the 21st century. These social ruptures, the chasm between rich and poor, between white and black and brown peoples, they aren't new, but they're being given a whole new context and quite frankly, a new urgency. A de facto racial resegregation of communities and resources reverberates at all levels. In the arts, our social separation is one of the greatest challenges to building a more equitable cultural ecology. Um, I actually remember Darren speaking at another one of these convenings in this very room, and jokingly, but in all seriousness, he talked about the number of people who have asked him to have Oprah join their boards. And I know that the grant makers who are present in this room are very used to being asked for black and Latino and other people of color board members, you know, kind of like it's an employment agency and you send, send, a, send a board member. Um, or, you know, kind of worse, hearing how despite enormous effort, there are no qualified diverse candidates. So this really speaks to the homogeneity of our social circles and our networks. And this is an enduring legacy of institutionalized racism. But let's look at this on a resource level. A quick reminder of the inequity in arts funding. Um, this is from Holly Sidford's landmark report for the National Committee on Responsive Philanthropy. And it quantified what we know empirically Organizations with budgets larger than $5 million make up just 2% of the sector, but they receive the majority, more than half of the sector's total arts funding. And only 10% of all grant dollars go to supporting arts that explicitly benefit communities of color and other marginalized communities. So clearly this is a major paradigm shift that we know needs shifting. But there are others as well. Our programmatic frameworks are outdated. We have evolved from multiculturalism, which was a critical mandate uh, for cultural assertion, but one that devolved into arts policy that tended to keep people in representative, meaning underfunded, boxes. So diversity and inclusion are, of course, critical 
But diversity is still about in including people into a dominant cult uh, power structure, right? Into dominant culture paradigm, into that status quo. And our language maintains that cultural perspective. For example, even before I was at Ford, but totally the whole entire time I was here, um, I, I always ask people, what are the demographics of where you work, your city, your town, your region? And while I was here, I often heard arts leaders tell me, well, you know, I think they're about 55% minority or 60% minority or, you know, maybe 70% minority. Um, okay, I wasn't a math major. <laughs> But even I know that once you hit over 50%, that is no longer a minority. And so now we have, now we have these oxymoronic terms, right? You know, like majority minority, you know, it's kind of like um, soft rock or, you know, ugly beautiful, right? I prefer to say the new American plurality. Changing demographics force us to reconsider terms like underrepresented, underrepresented to whom, and mainstream, which have been given new meaning or made irrelevant or completely turned on their heads. So what happens to our lexicon and our ways of thinking when what we have always accepted as the mainstream is just one of many rivers? So today we will start a cultural remapping of America together. And this wouldn't be possible without the extraordinary Art Change Us team. Um, I'd like to recognize, and if you guys can just wave, or I'm going to bring you down later on in the day, but just please, uh, our program director, Kristen Calhoun, <laughs> Daniela Alvarez, Nadine Friedman Roberts, Toran Moore, and Elizabeth Webb, and Kapena Alapa, I just wave if you're in the room. They are artists and cultural organizers and now generation leaders. And we are anchored by two incredible institutional partners. I mean, you heard from Stephen, actually one of our first conversations when he broke down the 48% of students of color at um, CalArts and then added on top of that the number of, inter of international students. Right away that said to me something about his thinking because most universities conflate those numbers to boost up the quote minority percentage. Um, it's an extraordinary place and I want to thank Stephen and his trustees and the very impressive staff and faculty there. Every day I am continually impressed by the talent and diversity of CalArts students and the depth of the work there. I also want to give profound thanks to the brilliant Ian Inaba and his staff at the Citizens Engagement Lab. They are an incubator and accelerator for social justice projects and a field-changing Ford Foundation grantee that incubated this project and are one of our two institutional partners. They're in Oakland, California. Thank you so much, Sel. Um, <laughs> so, our 14 core partners are artists and visionaries. Um, they're, they are all associated with an institution, but it's not about the institution so much as it is about their leadership. They're a brain trust and a courageous table that cuts across disciplines and geographies. Each one represents a powerful network. So, for example, just looking there, James Cass has built an extraordinary network of spoken word poetry organizations across America, nearly a hundred of them. Uh, Maria de Leon, I mentioned before, and NALAC, uh, funds and programs Latino arts in the United States and transnationally. Carlton Turner, work through alternate works, uh, we, alternate routes, works with 13 South and Southeastern states. And Lori Poirier with the First Peoples Fund, uh, Indigenous America, which actually means America. Um, <laughs> We believe that the demographic lens is not just about counting numbers, as that approach can further marginalize people, especially Native people. I've been to countless arts meetings where we start with an indigenous prayer for some reason, and then there's actually nothing, you know, substantively involving Native people. 
Um, but we believe Indigenous America is where some of our greatest leadership models can be found, and this work is embedded into our core partners, and you will see it woven throughout the day. We also as challenge the assumption that the arts of diverse communities is emergent and fragile. It is underfunded, yes, in the not-for-profit world. But in a society that grapples with segregation of resources and communities, there are entire parallel universes functioning at scale and in alternative com um, economies and cultural approaches. We need to learn from this. And you will also hear about those examples today. So we begin this welcome actually midstream. Today really started a few hours ago. As Stephen said, um, you know, how can I change now to this formal talk when he was actually in, in an incredible writing workshop. A core value of Art Change Us is leading with the art. So we started with the experiential, the immersive, the participatory. We will always ask our participants to join us to be brave and risk the unknown and involve themselves in the process. And to our peer artists who we bring to these gatherings, we always want you to go away with some new tools and new perspectives to work with. So, let's get on with the work. Our first all session is a call and response. Jeff Chang, author of Who We Be, The Colorization of America, is going to help us take a fresh look at this evolving cultural project called America. He will be followed by five responses from different locations and different points of view. And we're gonna try something different. We're not gonna do an audience Q&A because we've programmed opportunities for you to meet in small breakouts over lunch. So Daniel, uh, Danielle Jackson, co-founder of the Bronx Documentary Center, is going to serve as our interlocutor with follow-up questions. Thank you and welcome Jeff Chang. Thank you. How's everybody doing today? Um, I'm just really humbled and honored to be able to be here uh, today at the launch of Art Change Us. Um, my deepest mahalo first to Roberta, who's been um, an amazing guide, um, a mentor, somebody who's changed my life profoundly. So thank you very much uh, for being in my life and all of our lives. Uh, thank you as well to the Ford Foundation and to CalArts for funding this really, really important project, Art Change Us. Um, it's a visionary project, and I think it comes at exactly uh, the right place, um, at exactly the right time to redefine, to reframe, catalyze, to create, and to collaborate. Because we're living through a historical moment. Um, 11 months ago, November 2014, Barack Obama issued an executive order to stop deportations uh, for uh, millions of undocumented immigrants. And conservatives immediately um, vowed to fight those actions. They, one of them even got up and said there's going to be anarchy and violence in the streets. And sure enough, in Austin, Texas, uh, a few days after the executive actions, there was a gunman who went out, shot up the police department, fired 200 rounds, um, was on his way to blow up the Mexican consulate when they finally shot him dead in the street. And after he was shot dead, uh, he was found to have a bag full of IEDs, uh, a book full of targeted places that he was going to attack. That was the same week that the grand jury in Ferguson returned a non-indictment on Officer Darren Wilson in the shooting of Michael Brown. And then a couple weeks later, of course, uh, the grand jury in Staten Island returns a non-indictment uh, against Daniel Pantaleo in the killing, the strangling of Eric Gardner. And suddenly there's a movement that's out in the streets, Black Lives Matter movement. And so we're living in a historic moment. And in a lot of ways, it's a once in a generation moment in which we've reached a crisis point in dealing with issues of race, straight up. And we seem doomed to, to repeat this every generation if we don't stand up to the challenge of transforming ourselves. 
Right now, more Americans said than at any time since 1992 believe that the U.S. Uh, is really facing a turning point in race relations, that we've reached a crisis point. It's become one of the most important issues on the national agenda. 1992, of course, was the year of the Los Angeles riots. And the moment before that, when polls had shown such a spike in interest in race relations, was 1965, which is, of course, the year of Selma, the year that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, the year that Robert Kennedy uh, was assassinated, the year that the Voting Rights Act passed, the year that the Immigration and Nationality Act passed, and it's the year that the Watts riots uh, ushered in what we now call the post-civil rights era, which, been, which has been largely an era of backlash and reaction. So if we take these different points, right, 1965, 1992, right now, uh, 1965 marked the last moment that we had a national consensus to address racial inequality and cultural equity. We didn't produce that same kind of consensus in 1992. And now in 2015, it's really difficult for us to imagine Congress taking up, right, any kind of change, any kind of reform around these kinds of questions of racial equity and cultural, uh, racial equality and cultural equity. We can point, for instance, to the issue of climate change because while indigenous communities are having their sovereignty and their security challenged right now by both drought and by storms and floods uh, that are the result of a warming world, precious little has been done to be able to move us forward to where we need to be. The issue is still defined by drill baby drill. And in his waning years, Obama has attempted to move initiatives via executive actions. But as we've seen, uh, he's encountering a large cultural war backlash. So this past summer, Donald Trump and Ben Carson sounded notes of division. They used Islamophobia and xenophobia to move to the top of the polls. And together, the Republicans offered immigration proposals that each seemed more insane than the last. So if we just go through a few of these, you'll see what I'm talking about. <laughs> All the candidates suppo uh, supported uh, a supposed uh, so-called Great Wall of Mexico. <laughs> well, Scott Walker, in his short, brief sort of run for the presidency, supported a Great Wall built across the Canadian border. And to be fair, a lot of Canadians thought this was going to be a really great idea. <laughs> uh, but Scott Walker's uh, candidacy didn't last that long. Chris Christie suggested that we should track immigrants like FedEx packages. Barcode, scanner, immigrant, right? And one day, Jeb Bush started going off in anchor babies. And so now, the Republicans are talking about ending birthright citizenship, a constitutional right, right, that was affirmed 120 years ago in Wong Kim Ark versus U.S. In their haste to win political points with a shrinking minority of voters, uh, they're threatening to undo the entire 14th Amendment. And in all of these proposals, they're dehumanizing people, the migrant, right? To them, the migrant is something, uh, someone, something, someone only capable of fulfilling a transaction of uh, working, laboring, or dropping an anchor baby, right? Uh, they're not humans, they're transactions. And they're playing more than ever, the Republican Party is playing more than ever to white anxiety, what Barbara Ehrenreich called in the 1980s, a fear of falling. Now we know that economic dislocation is real. We see economic non-recovery in which everyone's taken a beating. But of course the burden has fallen hardest in people of color. So after the peak of the market in the mid-2000s, white household median net worth dropped by 16%. But it dropped by 53% for African Americans, by 54% for Asian Americans, by 66% for Latinos. So the larger context then is all about inequality. It's about the rewidening of racial gaps in income, in wealth, in education, and it's about the reality of resegregation. Let's talk about resegregation for a second. Now that wealth and whites are moving back into the cities, there's a lot of talk about gentrification. But what becomes of those, right, the poor people and the people of color who are displaced? Well, they're forced out of the city. Uh, they're disappeared out of the cities, into the decaying suburbs. And so these old suburbs are already proving to be the new flashpoint. So we shouldn't only be speaking about gentrification, right? Gentrification is only the visible side 
of a much larger issue of resegregation. Resegregation is the reason that this decade's new flashpoints are not just divided cities like Baltimore, which have always been segregated, but Sanford, a suburb of Orlando, or Ferguson, a suburb of St. Louis. Trump succeeds as a cultural figure because he masks the truth of economic dislocation. Ben Carson succeeds because he masks the truth of resegregation. They instead manufacture specters where none exists. So Trump's arguments have been particularly revealing. During a period in which immigration has dropped dramatically, he conjures hordes of quote unquote illegals stealing US jobs and tax dollars. Not so different from the past, right? But recently, he tried to tie undocumented immigrants to the uprising in Ferguson, projecting the time-tested image of youths of color uh, marauding through the streets. It's like the truth doesn't even matter. In Ferguson, the activists and the artists and the organizers uh, there tell us the truth, that the violence there is mainly a product of the state. It's the same state that killed Mike Brown, Von Derrick Myers, Kajime Powell, and Kimberly Randall King. It's the same state that over-polices uh, poor people of color in order to fund their municipal budgets. It's the same state that segregates people of color into a small handful of towns in the North County. It's the same state that sends the same heavy artillery into the streets of Ferguson that they send down to police the border. And I'm citing all of this to say that, like climate change, it seems that the culture wars have become a permanent feature of our daily lives. Demographobia, which is a word that my friend Samuel Lim uh, coined as a joke, demographobia, the irrational fear of changing demographics, <laughs> right? Demographobia, right? He's, he coined it as a joke, but now it seems to rule everything around us, right? So up against demographic change, uh, irreversible demographic change, Trump and the Republicans project a world of their ghastly imaginings. What I'm saying is there's real stakes to the work that we're doing. It seems so long ago that Obama was elected as a symbol of reconciliation, but now four in 10 Americans believe that racial divisions have gotten worse during the Obama years. And so we seem to be caught in a bad loop of history. So even in this time, right, of same-sex marriage, of Jay-Z and Beyonce, of Sasha and Malia, of Rachel Dolezal and Michael Derrick Hudson, uh, the question of identity is as troubled as ever. And perhaps now in this moment when, when politics is broken down, in this moment of change, of confusion, of fear, in this moment of powerful feeling and equally powerful inertia, perhaps now is a time when we need arts uh, more than ever to help us see through the fog uh, to clearly apprehend what our new realities are. And perhaps even more, arts and culture may be the only place for us to start. It may be the moment right now for culture to lead. And so artists must continue to help us to be able to see each other in our full humanity. In this regard, we inherit the struggles of the multiculturalists uh, who are trying to undo the invisibility that Ralph Ellison spoke of in 1952 when he wrote, I'm an invisible man. I'm invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. When they approach me, they see only their surroundings, themselves or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me. In the 1970s, when radical people of color and feminists of color collectives began to call themselves multiculturalists, they believed that by making and circulating images and songs and stories of the marginalized, they might be able to, to end erasure and invisibility, and that in doing so, enable bonds of empathy to be built. But at a moment when diversity is of great value to big business, to the military, to the state, when our images depict us as one happy rainbow nation, uh, we see the structures of power, including the national cultural complex, right? So the culture industry and the nonprofit arts world uh, is still overwhelmingly white. And we recognize that we haven't yet achieved cultural equity. Instead, the status quo is to figure out how to accommodate underrepresentation and appropriation. By contrast, cultural equity is about ensuring that the marginalized can make and circulate their images, songs, and stories, and that these can be seen and heard and read and experienced by everyone. At minimum, this is what we should be asking for. Equal access to creativity, the tools of creativity, and to distribution. But we also know that in a moment when the Black Lives Matter movement reminds us that Eric Garner and Tamir Rice 
and Sandra Bland, and even Antonio Zambrano Montez were not seen in all of their humanity, right? Ellison said, right, they uh, refuse to see me. They see only my surroundings themselves are figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me. We know that all of this is still not enough. Being able to see each other must also be matched by ways in which we share and build together. So yes, transformation literally requires work. And here the late great and deeply missed centenarian visionary Grace Lee Boggs has helped so much to expand our understanding of how change really happens. She wrote that we used to understand revolution as, quote, being tough as nails, committed to agitating and mobilizing angry and oppressed masses to overthrow the government and seize state power by any means necessary in order to reconstruct society from the top down. But now we understand how to make change differently, thanks to feminism, the environmental justice movement, indigenous movements, racial justice movements. Grace called on us to understand the importance of what Martin Luther King Jr. in his Beyond Vietnam speech called uh, a revolution of values, right? That would help us to face down the three related evils of the world, racism, militarism, and materialism. And so we need to center these different values. And this is exactly what Roberta did in building a cohort with future aesthetics over the course of more than a decade, centering the values of excellence, of mutuality, of generosity. In turn, this cohort helped build ecosystems that are still transforming the nonprofit arts world. So we want to continue to be about building sustainable, creative ecosystems. And these ecosystems are not ends in of themselves. We want to build them because we want to build our communities into cauldrons of sustainable and protein creativity, into spaces that recognize that diverse encounters are the key to growth, to security, and transformation. Because if we're able to strengthen our communities, then we're changing society from the bottom up. And in this regard, diversity is not chaos to be managed, which is the way that a lot of institutions view the question right now with a view from the top down. Instead, diversity is the very well of creativity. We dig deep to make the well. We use the water to build the ecosystems. And we do everything that we can to keep the well pure and to keep it replenished. Diversity is not the end in itself. It's the means for attaining equity. So this means rethinking the institutions to open them up to all. It's necessary but not enough to include more voices from different backgrounds. We need to move institutions away from being mere containers for culture that people are being herded into and to transform them into catalysts for creativity that people feel ownership of uh, and responsibility for. Grace wrote, we are beginning to understand that the world is always being made and is never finished. That activism can be the journey rather than the arrival. That struggle doesn't always have to be confrontational but can take the form of reaching out to find common ground with the many others in our society who are also seeking ways out from alienation, isolation, privatization, and dehumanization by corporate globalization. Now, I was in Las Vegas yesterday. Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess better. Um, there, there's something about Vegas that makes it um, really attractive. It's like the happiest place on earth for adults, right? Um, including my parents, uh, who are part of this like mass group of folks that's traveling from, uh, from the islands, from Hawaii to, to Vegas every single day. So I, I flew in uh, on the first flight in from San Francisco, 6 in the morning, and got on a rental car bus, and there was an older uh, Pacific Islander woman sitting across me, uh, and she was sitting with her husband, and he had a Vietnam uh, vet hat on, um, and you know, also Polynesian looking. And she's in this really warm pink sweater. He's dressed up in a jacket as well. And you can always tell that they're from Hawaii because they're all bundled up for the morning weather, uh, which has hit like the mid-70s. Um, <laughs> and, and, and the Denise Williams song comes on, Let hear, Let's Hear It For The Boy. And she starts nodding her head. She's all getting into it, right? She's like, my baby may not be rich. You know, <laughs> he's watching every day, <laughs> but he loves me, loves me, loves me. He always have a real good time. All right, I'm not going to sing anymore. You get the point, right? She's like getting into it. She's like, let's hear it for the boy. Like, we're going to go get our rental car. We're going to have a lot of fun. This is going to be great. There's just a sense of delight in her eyes. She was uh, so happy to be there. 
And I admire Vegas for its completeness of vision. I mean, it's a strange place. You have New York City, you got Paris, you got Egypt, you got Venice, you got Rome, right? It's all there in Vegas, literally sprouting out of the desert, right? Um, but on any given day, on Fremont Street or the Strip, there's probably also more diversity per square mile than anywhere in the world. Um, it's true, it's, it's a babble of languages, uh, the food, like you can be on Fremont Street and, and in the like sort of random anonymous international court, you can get a decent bowl of Taiwanese beef noodle soup or menudo, right? Like it's for hangovers, I guess, I don't know. Um, but comfort food, right, comfort food. And, and so there's workers, there's families, the kids, uh, there's, there's all kinds of folks there um, moving through this sort of finely articulated vision of the American dream, right? The American dream in which there's the promise of instant wealth, uh, of comfort, of entertainment, of, of excitement that's always there, just right, right there, right in front of you, right? And it's part of Vegas' mythology that, that it was built on stolen land with stolen money. It's a city that was built by gangsters uh, who were out to build the new, new frontier in, in the desert. This sort of tabula rasa on which you would erect this vision of the future. And inclusion was not a part of this vision. Housing covenants um, and, and segregationist policies, policies all shaped the geography of what's now uh, Las Vegas. But now diversity, of course, is very much a reality because sometimes the color of money helps people to see that there's other colors in the rainbow as well. Um, and so diversity is very much a reality, but inequity is still very, very real. So Vegas is also very disquieting to me in a lot of ways. You have artificial waterfalls, uh, you have nightly water shows um, on the strip that waste thousands of gallons of water at the same time that Lake Mead is at a historic low, right? Uh, from Fremont Street to the Strip, Vegas may not only have the most diversity per square mile, but it's probably got the most uh, ATM machines and check cashing places um, and, and pawn shops per square mile as well. And due to the financial systems that were designed on these casino values, you have real estate everywhere uh, that's underwater, right? Um, the suburbs that are spread across this desert are underwater. There's still dozens of neighborhoods where the, the land has been cleared, uh, the hills have been graded for these houses that may never ever be built. Uh, and inequality in Vegas is climbing at a much faster rate than it is for uh, most other metropolitan areas in the country. And this is not a sustainable vision of a local and American or a global future. And so here's where Grace Lee Boggs calls us to rebuild. She says, quote, unquote, rebuild, redefine, and re-spirit from the ground up. Our opportunity is not just to say no to the systems that are harming us, but to remake ourselves and our communities in the process. And so I end my part of this call with a tribute to Grace's method, which is really an artist's method. Grace's Grace's art was really about moving people uh, together in, in the direction of a much more sustainable future. Um, and her method was to move away from posing answers to posing questions and trusting in the process of the community to find a way. And so we ask in the spirit of grace, in the respiriting of grace, what does art and culture concern with the question of freedom look like now? What kind of freedom movement do we want to build for the 21st century? How can we together dream of new futures that are sustainable and that center radical diversity again? And how can we make this dream delightful? How can we make it irresistible to all? Thank you so much for listening. Hi, everyone. That was fantastic, wasn't it? Yes, OK. My name is Danielle Jackson. I'm going to be your interlocutor. We have five artists and cultural workers who are really doing uh, the hard work and the visionary imaginary that Jeff has talked about. And they're going to come out and they're going to present a response to Jeff's call. I'm going to ask them a few questions. Um, there will be no Q&A, but you'll have time throughout the day to address everyone and to talk and to have conversations with one another. So first, we're going to have uh, Adrienne Marie Brown, who's the co-editor of Octavia's Brood. She's here from Detroit. 
and uh, I'll let her take it away. Thank you. Hi. Hey. Where did Jeff go? It's, yeah, it's. I, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. I love you. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to start by saying I'm very emotional right now. Grace Lee Boggs is a good friend of mine and my mentor, and just sitting back there and listening to her wisdom just roll over me. I'm, I'm like, I'm going to cry, but I'm going to use my, my time <laughs> to talk to you first, and then I'll go cry. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm Adrian Marie Brown. Octavia's Brood is an anthology of original science fiction from, or it's science fiction from the social justice movements. And it's 20 stories and two essays. And the premise of it is that all organizing is science fiction. All organizing is science fiction. Anything that you're trying to do to change the world is actually science fictional behavior. And the reason we think this is because we've never seen any of these things um, or any many, many more things, a world without racism, without sexism, without gender um, phobia, <laughs> without all the things that we're up against. We haven't experienced it. We don't have it in our systems, in our bodies. So we're trying to create something brand new. And we think of it as that, that bending the arc towards justice or bending the world towards justice. It's science fictional. We're actually creating the future. This is much more fun for those of us who have organizing backgrounds than how we often get cast in the story of changing the world, which is we're just reading Marx in a dark basement with our <laughs> phones off and the batteries in the car and you know, just being super paranoid while stocking up on um, soup. So um, actually, no, we're totally like a collective neo force like rolling through the world and changing everything. And it's really an exciting role to get to occupy. Um, Octavia, the Octavia in our title is Octavia Butler. That's who we're referring ourselves to and claiming as our ancestor in the lineage of our work. She was a black science fiction writer. She wrote 12 novels and a collection of short stories. And now more things are coming out to those of us who think of her as a prophet saint. <laughs> um, and she died almost 10 years ago now. There's going to be a lot of anniversaries and celebrations next year about her 10 years as an ancestor. But she taught us, all that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. And she used all of her work to address the scary aspects of her time, the things that made her feel like, are we going to be here in the future or not? She's not the first person to write this kind of work. She was one of the most um, impressive and compelling to write this work. She was the first black female science fiction writer to be rewarded, celebrated. She won the MacArthur Genius Grant. She's amazing. If you haven't read everything that she's written and you're trying to do this work, you should just stop, pause, go on a retreat, <laughs> go to Mexico, read it all, get it in your system, reboot. Um, there's a couple of things I'm going to share with you. The Octavia's Brood comes out of myself and my co-editor, Walida E. Marisha. She's based in Portland. I'm based in Detroit. Ours was a Skype love affair. We heard that each other were basically being organizers, social justice people with nerdy sci-fi stuff happening in the back room. And we were like, do you want to come out as people who really look to science fiction as a strategic basis for everything? And she was totally down <laughs> to do that. Um, and so we started meeting by Skype. And we decided to do this project to pull together this anthology. And no publisher was interested in it. Because what we said was, we want to ask a bunch of people who don't write to write science fiction stories about the future. And we'll make them good, because we're nerds, so we know it's good. We've watched everything, Star Trek, Star Wars, everything that exists, so we know. Um, so just we don't have any books like this yet, but just trust us. And they were all like, no, this is a horrible idea. We should have writers do it. You should have partnered them up with some writers, and then like, just as people can tell the writers their ideas. And we're like, no, we actually believe that every single human being has their own many, 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 many worlds inside of them. And they don't need it to go through uh, a conduit. They need to start to say and claim the space. right? The future that we see right now, the majority that we see right now, is this dystopian sci-fi movie or sci-fi story that usually stars Matt Damon coming in to save all of the black people and the brown people, who, or just generally dirty people. Like Mad Max did that kind of, it's like, what is that person? I can't tell. They're so dirty. Um, and I say this with all respect to Matt Damon. 
I think he's, I think he's doing his best for given where he started in life, he's doing good. But I don't want him to save me, like in my community. Like our idea is visionary fiction. So the other, only other slide I have for y'all, we, we've been working within this concept of visionary fiction. And so here's some of the elements of it, right? Explores current social issues, everything that's going on through the lens of science fiction. It's conscious of identity and particularly intersecting identities, not asking everyone to choose, 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 check off the box, right? It's conscious of power inequalities. It's realistic and hard, but hopeful. And this is our answer to the utopian versus dystopian, right? It's either one or the other. What we found in real life is that the two always go hand in hand and actually rely deeply on each other. So right now in this city, probably within a block of each other, there's someone living a utopia. There's someone living a dystopia. It's always together. So how do we actually start to name a hard and realistic, hopeful future where that line stops being so hardcore? starts being blurred, starts being something where we all get to experience the full range of human experiences. Um, we really look at change happening from the bottom up rather than the top down. So even in the stuff I love, Battlestar Galactica and others, there's like some general, you know, there's some top person who ultimately is going to still tell us how it's going to be. But we found that the models that happen in real life, the Zapatistas, the Black Lives Matter work, it actually comes up in a different way. It bubbles up from authentic relationships that are happening on the ground. So we want more people to tell those stories. Change is this collective process. It's generally not a singular person who's able to save everyone. We have yet to identify the person who is superhero you know, in the traditional way. And yet we see in our community all the time People who are able to fly, who are able to levitate, who are able to compel, who are able to do this magic. And at this point, um, places like Detroit where I live, places like New Orleans, other places, there's no scientific reason for us to think we have a future. Only magic, only science fiction, only dragons, only unicorns. That's the only way we're getting through all this stuff that's coming directly towards us from the, the stuff that we've already put in motion. Right? So we were like, we better write this. This is ours. And then it's not neutral. The purpose is to actually change. Um, one of the things I'll share, I wrote down some notes, but like not too many, because I wanted to speak from my heart. But as I said, my heart is with grace, wanting to cry. But one of the things I wanted to share with y'all is that the concept of who gets to create the future has to change along with the numbers of who gets to, who's here, right? So right now, who gets to create the future are the top leading businessmen, the top leading entrepreneurs, and the top leading government folks. Our premise is that actually every single person needs to think of themselves as responsible for that collaboration. Grace Lee Boggs taught us you have to transform ourselves to transform the world. So we ask people, are you willing to be a co-creator of that future? Not just a critiquer. We're super good at deconstructing everything that's completely a mess with what exists now. We're so good at that. So we can check that box. Yes. Now, do we have the imagination to, to actually come up with what it is we long for, what we want, and what we want to bring into being? And can we transform ourselves? Understand that imagination creates the outer border of what's possible. Right? And if we're not flexing that muscle and constantly expanding it, then we're only going to keep coming back to the same tropes, the same process, the same power dynamics that we have now. The last thing I'll say is not me saying it's Tony K. Bambara just coming through. <laughs> the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. That's our inquest to you, is to join us as co-creators of the future and make the revolution completely irresistible. I hope you'll join us. I hope you'll write something. You can email it to me at adriamaria at gmail.com, and I will publish it right away on our website, DetroitSciFiGenerator.wordpress.com. I'll talk to you soon. Hi. Okay. Yes. So that was fantastic. One of the first things that really struck me was um, the freedom and the pleasure in which you get to talk about being a nerd. And I don't know if it's Juno Diaz that really opened the door for people of color to be open about being into sci-fi. But um, I think it's important when you talk about the full range of human experience and the sort of intersectionality and the new identities that are able to be free. Yeah. Um, you're making a way for that, so that's really exciting. Thank you. Um, are you a nerd too? I am in different ways. Okay, good. Like, and we've I'm, all got our own way. Yeah, it's like, it's like a very I have personal my own. Thing. Yeah. I, exactly. It's like this is what I do when I'm alone in my house. And we have yeah. to make a place for that's it. That's great. So, <laughs> um, 
So awesome. maybe to that end, if you could talk a little bit more, when we talk about the pleasure of being whatever you are, pleasure yeah. activism, that's part of your work. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I call myself a pleasure activist. Mm -hmm. And when people hear that, they're like, so <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> oh, what does that mean? Yeah. They get very like blush and everything before we even get there. I'm like, uh -huh. it's not, I mean, it might be what you think, but my main thing um, is, <laughs> I hope all of you have pleasurable experiences all the time. Yeah. Um, there is, like, it started out with doing sex and drug education and feeling like we keep framing it from terror and fear, hmm. and we need to frame it from, this will increase your pleasure. Like, you'll have more and more orgasms and more sex and more highs and more all of it if you go about it in a safe way. Mm -hmm. But then it started to feed into all this other stuff in my life where I realized that we frame everything that way. Everything is like, stop doing this, you're going to ruin the world. Stop doing this, you're going to destroy everything. Um, and instead, it's like, what if we made justice the most pleasurable experience that you could have as mm -hmm. a human being, mm -hmm. right? So being a part of a community, being fully accepted, being fully seen as who you really are with all your mistakes and everything else, what if that became the most pleasurable experience? Yeah. So I'm trying to get as many people as possible to shift the frame from stop, 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 bad, bad, bad terror to like join into this warm, fuzzy, amazing, sensual world that we live in that is actually so incredible and organic and amazing. Mm -hmm. And you can protect it, and you can nurture it, and you can sustain it. And it's just a beautiful place to be. And I feel that that framework is more interesting than uh, another. That's yeah. That's that's great. Okay, good. <laughs> no. Well, okay, you're a pleasure activist too, then. <laughs> yeah, but I also think that um, some of what you're talking about with the aspect of magic and it's only going to take dragons. There's also a yeah. real crossover with lots of um, traditions, whether they're indigenous traditions, yeah. whether they're African diasporic yes. traditions of magic and other things, and yeah. like there are other ways in, and exactly. those things are also enjoyable too. Yeah, that's um, one so of the reasons why we said visionary fiction uh -huh. as opposed to speculative sci-fi uh -huh. or whatever, because people were like, well, that's not technically science, so right. that could never happen. Right. And we're like, well, no, I mean, it's magical realism or it's myth or exactly. it's something else that <laughs> helps us get here. So right, right. yeah, it's we can claim we you know from Arisha to everything. Uh -huh. We're just like yes. Uh -huh. It's all part of our systems of the future. Exactly. And the past. Can you say a bit about um, outside of the book, the work you're doing to merge social justice with visionary fiction? Awesome. That's good. So we um, we wanted this to never just be a book project, right? Mm -hmm. So we created a series of workshops that go with it. And as we've been touring. We're organizers, so we're like, come and we'll do the book event. But then we also do these workshops. The main two workshops that we've done in most places, one is a sci-fi writing workshop, collect collective sci-fi writing workshop. Mm -hmm. So everyone comes in, and we build a world together to address some problem. We're like, what problem needs visionary fiction thrown at it? Right. And then, so in Detroit, we've done a lot around food access and water rights and water wars. and water warriors, and so everyone builds this collective world. They come up with characters, the setting, what are the assumptions people are holding that we need to challenge? Mm -hmm. What is the conflict where we can create change? So that one, we, I've done a series of salons in Detroit to host these, and we, then we do them around the country, and it's mind-blowing, because people then go off and write, come back and share it, and they're like, oh, all of these universes exist from the same creation point. We mm -hmm. made this, and how can we go out and use that in the world? The other one is a direct action and sci-fi workshop that I adore. And it's basically, we just ask people, what are your favorite science fictional worlds? You can choose anything you want to. You can get really down in the weeds. Mm -hmm. And then go into that world in small groups mm -hmm. and create a direct action for the most oppressed or marginalized people in there that transforms the future of it. Okay. And so people are like in there with the orcs and being like, oh my gosh, the orcs are like born into oppression, but what if they were like liberated into their power, mm -hmm. you know? So <laughs> it's very, very exciting. Yeah. And then like, how do we then apply that to this moment when we need really creative direct actions that uh -huh. help people get past their racism, their homophobia, their assumptions yes. about what can be. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And thank all of you. And thank you. <laughs> I'll take the picture. Yes. OK. Next, we have Edwin Torres, who is the, let me make sure I read this properly, because I'm going to get confused. He's the acting commissioner for the Department of Cultural Affairs. And he's going to speak about a new initiative. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. OK, great. So hi, I'm Eddie Torres. I'm acting commissioner of cultural affairs for the city of New York. And 
I'm really excited to be in this conversation today. First of all, I just feel privileged to, to be in such company. Um, and second of all, you know, the issue of demographic change, the future of America is happening right here now, um, here in New York City. So, you know, this slide looks at uh, the U.S. population uh, from the, what is it, 1900 uh, on, and compares this with uh, the population demographics of the workforce and audiences in museums nationally. And this is relevant for us, because here in New York, it was around the late 1800s that our museum started, probably in the 60s that the Department of Cultural Affairs became its own standalone agency. And so, in this mayoral administration, we're really looking at this issue of diversity as a means to equity. And in the cultural world, this for us is a strategy for both sustainability and for growth. I mean, this is an opportunity for us to be mindful about how we cultivate the audience, the workforce, the leaders, the donors of the future. And like I say, the future is here now in New York. So we started out with conversations like this, and we're also, you know, we're, we're just wrapping up the process now of doing a survey of all of our uh, cultural organizations, so a little over a thousand of them, right? So, you know, as, as this reveals, there are such surveys out in the world, um, but they tend to be of a thin slice of the field. This is just museums, and they also tend to reflect on national demographics, right? Well, this is what our demographics in New York City look like. And you have a real opportunity here, you know? And the way we're doing this by way of methodology is we have a third party firm that's actually executing all of this, right? You send, each individual organization is sending their data to this third party firm for a couple of reasons. One is they just have the technical capacity to manage all of this, right? We're a bunch of grant makers in my agency. Uh, two is we don't, want to receive individual level organizational responses because we're not going to intervene at every single individual organization. There's over a thousand of them. We don't have the capacity. And then finally, this firm is going to take this information and it's going to aggregate it and give it to us looking at organizations by type, by size, et cetera. So basically we're going to find out, okay, we're basically structuring the questions along the lines of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the federal uh, agency. And so we're looking at issues of uh, race, but we're also looking at issues of age, uh, disability, gender. And so we're going to get a report that basically says visual arts organizations, mid-sized visual arts organizations are particularly good at racial diversity in their programming staffs. So I'm making this up. But, um, or large... I'm, it's easy to over-interpret that joke. So uh, large uh, performing arts organizations are particularly good at gender diversity in their leadership, you know, et cetera. So we're going to take all of that information. We're bringing on a, a consultant. And the col consultant we're in process now is somebody who is going to be uh, an expert at these diversity issues. And is going to take these learnings and say, OK, well, what are the bright spots in the field? Where is the real expertise around these issues in the field? Uh, who are the heroes? Who is the future of our field? And who can we emulate? What practices can we adapt and uh, uh, adopt as a field? Then from there, they're going to basically partner with the field to develop a learning agenda for the field over the course of the next year. Ultimately, what we want is for these practices to be learned by the field, but taught by the field. We want this to be horizontal, authentic, and we believe that in this way, this can be sustainable at scale. Now, thus far, this has actually been very well received. We've, we're actually quite happy with the response we've been getting from the field. But with that said, I have to imagine there are anxieties. And anxieties that go underground and left unaddressed, these are the absolute worst, because they get manifest in really weird ways. Um, so the, the, the anxieties, from what I can tell, are probably there's two chief categories of them. One is the issue of, and I think this accompanies anything that, that looks like affirmative action. If you're going to be foregrounding opportunities for people of color, doesn't this create less opportunities for people of European American descent, right? This is a, a common thing you hear in a kind of discussion like this. The fact of the matter is, I understand that. 
The fact of the matter is this. If you actually look at any kind of statistical analysis of this, if you actually look at any sort of quantitative social science around this, this isn't the, the fact of how it uh, plays out in the world. Uh, Eduardo Bonilla Silva has actually done really good uh, scholarship around this. Um, when you create more opportunities for more people of color, it doesn't create less opportunities for white folks. It just it isn't the way if you look at it mathematically. Now, that seems mathematically anomalous, right? A limited number of a thing divided you know, differently creates less for somebody else. But then when you crosswalk that with other kinds of scholars, like Scott Page, for instance, who finds high levels of correlation between diversity and productivity, right? You have scholars like Scott Page who are saying, actually, more diverse workplaces are more effective workplaces. They tend to grow. When places tend to grow, you get more opportunities as an absolute number, so you can shift statistical, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, distribution, and still have equal opportunity. The other one, the other realm of anxiety is probably around, um, isn't this sort of an attack on the funding of organizations led by European Americans whose programming is largely European American in its, uh, in its origins? The fact of the matter is this. I worry that diversity has a bit of a brand problem. And a brand is basically what somebody feels when they think about you. And when somebody feels fear when they think about you, that's a brand problem. All right, unless you're, unless you're like a, you know, a thumb breaker or something like that, that's not what you ultimately want your brand to be. The fact of the matter is we want to lead with the carrot rather than the stick. Uh, we're going to spend a year basically holding up exemplary practice as practice to be emulated and working with the field to adopt exemplary practice. We're going to be holding up people who are doing this work well as leaders in the field and saying, you know what? We're all starting where we are, but we all can be as great as our peers. You know, a science fiction, this is actually a nice synergy with a... Uh, uh, our pleasure activist colleague, a science fiction writer once said, talking about technology, they said, the future is here. It's just unevenly distributed. I believe that's true of both demographic change, and I believe that that's true of strategies to embrace demographic change as an opportunity. What we ultimately want to do is make sure that the future is more evenly distributed so we all move into the future together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, two questions. Yes. The first would be, how is this survey uh, any different than other initiatives or efforts to gauge diversity? Sure. Uh, the survey is different probably because of uh, the scope of it. Like I say, we have over a thousand grantee organizations. Uh, we were sufficiently obnoxious as to make this a requirement of uh, our funding. And uh, so therefore we have 100% participation, which we're, great, we're grateful for. Um, <laughs> and, and, but the, the initiative is not the survey. The survey, just like the diversity is a means to equity, the, 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 the survey is a means towards this year of programming. And again, this is something where we really want to lead with the carrot rather than the stick. This is something where we really want to hold up good practice rather than focus all of our energies on those organizations who are struggling with this rather than focus all of our energies as to what you shouldn't do or what's being done poorly, we actually want to hold up as exemplars those who are doing this well. So part and parcel to that, what do you say to uh, members of organizations or directors of organizations who say, well, I, we can't find people, there aren't enough people, um, we've tried, or, yeah. I mean, I think yeah. about Roberta's point about the, hum, our, the homogenization of our social circles sure. and how that translates sure. into our professional circles as sure. well. Yeah. Um, no, this is a really interesting one. Again, this is sort of a, one of those moments where, where effective practice is really useful. I know no small number of organizations who very effectively have very diverse staffs. So, you know, my presumption is that we're all being genetically engineered someplace and it's only these handful of organizations who have access to this lab. And, and I like this mental image, too, of, of this lab that produces arts administrators of color because, uh, again, you know, looking at uh, um, 
our last speaker, I'm picturing something like the mothership from the old Parliament Funkadelic uh, uh, cartoons, you know? Um, and Dr. Funkenstein is creating yes. all of us, and we'll all return to our pods at night. Uh -huh. So the, the fact of the matter is, you know, we know these people in the field. And, and you know, I had the pleasure of, of uh, at my last position, working with a macroeconomist who looked at similar issues. And he said, well, I mean, to look at this from a strict econ uh, economist point of view, um, if these organizations are having such a struggle to find these diverse staff members, then you know those diverse staff members you know? Their phones must be ringing off the hook. They must be wildly wealthy. I mean, beyond your imagining, because they would be that actively recruited, that actively sought. I've not discovered this phenomenon. But, <laughs> but we know these people. Right, yes, yeah. absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. <laughs> Next, we have Dr. Uma Mysorekar of the Hindu Temple Society of America out of Flushing here in Queens, New York. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon as we greet as Namaste. I first thank uh, my good friend Roberta, Kristen, and all others of the Ford Foundation for having invited me here to this august audience. And I was thinking, as I was listening to my predecessors here, speakers, I was thinking, where do I fit in in this, actually? Because I really don't get involved in art as much. My field is totally different. But yet, Roberta thought I might fit in here. So let me share my little story with all of you. I'm a physician by profession. Came to this country late 60s from India, along with many, many, many. There was an enormous influx of Indians sometime in late 60s, early 70s. And all of them were professionals. Most of them were professionals. And when they all settled all over, most of them settled here in New York. Much later, they went to other states. And in New York, particularly in Flushing, for some reason. I don't know why. And as we all began to be concentrating on our own professions and wanting to do better economically, financially, do get more training, although with the view that we will have to go back to India, but our immediate concern was to make ourselves comfortable, our families comfortable. But then, then came a time where no matter how much you earn, or what you do, there is something that's missing in your system. There is something that is your family is missed and your spirituality is missed. And as a physician, I was actually brought up in a very religious family. But yet, I at least was taught how to separate the two. But then the spirituality which was in my blood began to give me this constant ringing in my ears that something needs to be done. If you want to be complete, if you want to do what you have come here to do, you must have some place of worship. And that's what really started this great institution called the Hindu Temple Society of North America, which is now located in Flushing, New York. For me personally, I went on with my profession for a good number of years, almost 34, 35 years. And simultaneously, I continue to give my time to the temple in many, many different ways, including cleaning and cooking, serving the people, just about anything and everything that any volunteer would do, because my dream, my vision, was to have this institution. Every community has a place of worship. That's what used to burn me. Why is it we as Hindus cannot have a place of worship? And everybody was kind of pessimistic in those days. And they said, well, we are a small community. As you all know, we are the latest, latest immigrants to this country. We are a small community, not extraordinarily affluent. It's difficult to build, difficult to sustain. But I had the faith. And I said, no, it doesn't matter if you have a small institution, but let's have something. And that is when we were started looking for a place. And here it is. There was a Russian Orthodox church right on Bound Street, which was there for sale at the time, for a meager $50,000. Cannot even imagine that $50,000 we purchased this. And it was in a very bad condition. But nonetheless, today, 
$50,000 a small room you cannot get. And uh, intense fundraising, and everybody came in together. Although there were people who were pessimistic, why do you want to build a temple? Even our own people. You know, people come to America to make money. Why do you need a temple? Why are you throwing money into this? I said, doesn't matter. We shall wait. I said, you know, we need it. We, our children will need it. Our families will need it. So eventually it came on to, we built a temple, which was opened up for consecration here. This is in 1977. The, the, the church was purchased sometime in 1973. We succeeded in getting a loan from a local bank. And uh, if I think back, uh, it's hard to believe that we got the loan. But then we did, and this was built in 1977. And as the, you know, uh, there is something extraordinary in spirituality. All of you have some form of spirituality. And you know that that draws you in. No matter what, as my friend, who is a very successful financial investor, he says to me, if I talk to my friends, go to the temple and worship, they'll say, no, 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 we don't want to go to the temple. But you will see them behind somebody's back when they're in trouble, they'll definitely go to the temple and worship. <laughs> because you, all of us believe in that supreme deity that who will come to our rescue at all times. All of us have that belief. And therefore, look at the amount of people. We have this celebration once a year. Close to about five, 6,000 people accompany this procession all around the streets of Flushing. As the temple continued to grow, we, the space became very small. See what to remember. What happened earlier were pessimistic. Now they said, it's too small. You've got to build a bigger temple, you see? And sure enough, we did is to purchase a lot of houses. The only way, I don't know how many of you know Flushing, Flushing is a place where land is more ex expensive than gold. You cannot get even a centimeter of land in Flushing. The only way we can raise properties in Flushing is to purchase houses, demolish, and raise them. So as the temple was being you know, we were thinking how to expand the temple. At the same time, our need was how to build the community. See, you have to also bring the community together, not just Hindu community, I'm talking the entire community. So with that vision in mind, we purchased about five or six houses, built a magnificent community center. This is just one portion of it. It is an auditorium, which is more than 700 capacity and welcomes everybody. We have lots of different communities in Flushing uh, who will come and utilize this auditorium. This is a place, something extraordinarily unique in that situation in Flushing. So we were very proud of that. It also has wonderful party halls and most famous temple canteen. If any of you would like to eat delicious Indian food, please do come. It has been, uh, it has been written up in Zakat Survey, New York Times, <laughs> and uh, Anthony Bourdain was there several times. <laughs> so all of you are most welcome to come there. Um, and as I was telling you, as we outgrew, then we wanted to start building. Now what do we do? We had to purchase more houses adjacent to the existing temple. And then to expand. In order for us to expand, it has to be authentic in Hindu temple. So we had to get these, what we call them as artisans from India. They are shilpis, they are hand workers. If you see them work with their hands and make these beautiful crafts, it's almost impossible to imagine. And this is all these, you see this man's hand, how he, this is all chisel, just nothing but stone and chisel. So he, we brought several of them, they actually did their handwork. The stones, every piece of stone came from India. They sat here day and night, chiseled, and made this temple what it is today. This is more than double the size today. More than double the size. The whole importance is this. Where there is a will, there is a way. And secondly, you have to make home where you are. And third, you have to respect the community. The community around you. 
We run a senior center, and senior center is for everybody. We have the Chinese, we have the non-Hindus. Everybody can come all free. We want to make our seniors as comfortable as possible. It's more of a support groups. You know, they have their uh, music, they have yoga, they have all kinds of things. From morning till evening, they spend their time. So it is good for the health for the community. And we also have youth forums. All children of all the communities, they come. They have their own dramas and skits and so forth. So I think in order for us to merge into the society, the changing demographics, as we've been hearing. It is important for every community to merge into the rest of the community. And it's also important for us to recognize that we need to address and we need to respect all the faiths around. And I, having been representing the temple for so many years, do get the great opportunity of attending many interfaith programs. And in, in those interfaith programs, some of them are really heartwarming because the true faith leaders will express their real desire that we must hold hands together and we must work together and we must bring that message over to the community. If you must build a successful community, a successful city, a successful country, you've got to have everybody together. In Hinduism, it says, there is what's called dharma. Dharma means righteousness. First is to yourself. If you don't take care of yourself, you cannot take care of the world. Second is your family. You've got to take care of the family. And the family is getting together. It is the county or the city which will be solid and stable. If the city is wonderful, it reflects on the state. And if all the states do this, it reflects on the country and eventually it reflects on the world. So this is the kind of dharma that we need to actually imbibe in just about everybody. So start with yourself being good to yourself. How can I help the community? How can I change the demographics? Where is it is malleable? And giving you one, my final example. As I was so busy with my practice, continue to give whatever time I could, eventually I decided now time has come for me that I should retire from medicine. For the last 27 years, I will tell you, I have been giving my time as a volunteer at the temple. For the last seven or eight years, I totally retired from my field of medicine. But I work more now than I was working <laughs> as a physician. Because I feel the responsibility is great on me. I owe it to the community. I'm answerable to the community. So, but I'm deeply grateful to Lord that he has given me this opportunity to serve and also to help our community to practice their religion, that is our Hinduism. And at the same time, welcome the rest of the community to tell them who we are and what we are. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So one aspect that I think that will be very interesting to people here is that this is a completely self-sustaining enterprise. So Jeff and uh, has spoke about movements coming from the ground up. I believe there's 22,000 uh, members. You're not grant supported or grant funded. You would not show up on Edwin's no, survey. No, absolutely not. And you mentioned it's not, an, it's not necessarily an affluent community. So can you yeah. speak about how you you galvanize people to be able to fund such an impressive project? You know, first and the foremost is when people have faith, they come. That's how I believe. You know, whenever whoever comes, I tell them, look, this is your temple, you know, and your children will come, your grandchildren will come here. Mm -hmm. And therefore, make sure that these are our projects, our visions. My vision now is to build a big outreach center. Mm -hmm. And I've already started publicizing that. I want to build a yoga meditation center. And our senior center, which has been there for the last 15 years, has outgrown so many people. Oh, we're all getting old, naturally. And so <laughs> we want to build a bigger senior center. But the thing has been, again, uh, my intense faith in God is that when I go and approach, and we have several fundraising functions also, and I literally display all the visions, all the projects, and I tell them, if there is something wrong, come up and criticize. Come up and give me some ideas. Mm -hmm. you know. And for senior centers, I tell you, many people came to tell me, oh, city gives. 
a lot of grants. Why don't you go and apply? Believe me, trust me today, I have applied for several grants. I haven't received a penny, a penny at all. You know, They throw back saying that something is wrong, this is wrong, that is wrong. Mm -hmm. I still don't know hey, where to correct all these things. I have no time for this, so <laughs> I just let go. Uh -huh. But God has been good to us, and we have donors. Even, I, I don't need people giving millions of dollars. Right. Even if they give, each one gives $100, you see, that also sustains. And we put away some money, like an endowment money, mm -hmm. that I say, now this is what is required for the project. We will not touch that funds, because my vision is we want to build, it costs X amount of dollars, we will keep it away. Yes. And many of us, uh, I tell you, um, among the trustees are also donors, and I tell them if you want to be a trustee, you have to make sure the projects are finished. So that is also their responsibility. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have Ty Defoe, who is a multidisciplinary artist, and he is from the Ojibwe and Oneida nations. And uh, he will give a talk and have a small performance. Thank you. <laughs> Aho, Buju, Anin in the Wayne Magnug. A Gijig indigena cause was swagging and don't bomb a gizzen and do them. Wabunung, Jaunung, Nagabinung, Minoki Wedinung. Miguetchka ega kinigago, a buggin in a gadego marking. Miguetchki je money do, Miguetchki je money do, Miguetchki je money do. Aho. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> My name is Ty. I'm from the Oneida and the Ojibwe tribes from the Great Lakes of Northern Wisconsin. <laughs> All right, so if we have any uh, Packers fans in the audience or cheese heads or slices, right, this is the region which my people come from. <laughs> um, I want to give a big, huge thank you to uh, Roberta Uno, as well as the other speakers today, and welcome you all here. And it is great honor to present this on our island of Matahata by the Lenape, the Mohegan, the Six Nations, and other tribal people, um, with I speak humbly uh, for many indigenous tribes today. Um, as well as for my elders. Today I'm going to be talking about a philosophy that's um, uh, rooted in storytelling, rooted in dance. And uh, this model that we're going to talk about through the arts and social justice is a shared leadership, right? This philosophy dates back to hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years, right? I'm going to present it. I'm going to tell you first and then I'm going to show you. It talks about this hoop or this circle of life being that we're all connected here on the earth. There's a story. I grew up on a small uh, reservation called Red Cliff Reservation, northern Wisconsin, and I was given this story that became my philosophy for life. It became philosophy for the work that I do. This story takes place a long time ago in this small person's village, right? This story takes place all the way up to 2015, right here, right here at the Ford Foundation building. They said when I was given the story that this young person's brothers and sisters were fighting and calling each other names. And so this young person didn't know what to do, so they started crying. Bah! They said, my brothers and sisters are fighting and calling each other names. I don't know what to do, right? And so that young person with real dark brown hair with this tiny little braid in the back, ran off into the forest and put their head down on a rock and started crying. Bah! I don't know what to do, they said, because their brothers and sisters were fighting and calling each other names. There was a lot of violence and fighting that was happening, right? This young person was feeling all of these human feelings and crying with sheets of tears falling down from their face, right? And finally, in the story, they said that Kichimanidu, this great mystery, heard this young person crying. They heard this young person crying and looked over the forest like that and saw this small little head with this tiny little braid in the back. Kichimanidu, the great mystery, went down to this young person and said, hey, what's going on? Put their hands 
on the young person's shoulders. The young person held their hands high up in the air like this, with sheets of tears falling down from their face. Hands high up in the air and said, oh, great mystery, great creator. I'm just having a bad day. Holy wa, right? And people say, Thai, what does holy wa mean? That means holy cow, right, in Ojibwe. It's this new term, right? So hashtag holy wa, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so they were just having a bad day. And what this story teaches us, and it reminds us that we're all like that young person. No matter how old we are, from the time we're very small, from the time we become an elder, right, and relive life again, at some point we have that small child within us where we're crying. And at the drop of the hat, as we're continuing to do this work, right, sheets of tears can fall down from our face, right? What we have touched is uh, this human connection, the human feeling, right? And so that young person was crying and crying. Gichimani, do the great mystery, handed the young person one of these hoops, one of these circular shaped objects in the story. The young person looked at it and looked at it and they said, what's this for? And the creator told the young person to make as many things in nature as you can. Watch nature and honor all things from the smallest blade of grass to a giant soaring eagle, to the two-legged, to the four-legged, to the winged, to the rooted. That young person did as they were instructed, much like a, a mentee. Gathered red willow that grew by the water, started making hundreds and piles and thousands of these hoops, and started dancing and dancing away to the rhythm of the earth, making all these beautiful trees and plants and flowers and animals and butterflies, things that they saw in nature. Well, they took that dance with all those beautiful images to the people who were still there, the brothers and sisters that were fighting with their fists still held in the air. And for one single moment, they say in this story, right? For one single moment, as the people were fighting, that young person was coming upon a hill with all of those hoops around them, soaring and dancing, creating circles, right? The people, one by one, dropped their fists in the air, and they smiled, and they said, holy wah, right? Let me try that dance. Holy cow, let me try that dance. So that young person grabbed one single hoop to all of the brothers and sisters, the cousins, the aunties, the uncles, and they all started dancing and dancing away, making all these beautiful trees and plants and flowers and animals and butterflies, things that they saw in nature. And they started to dance together and is what is known as the people's hoop dance. It is said no matter what race, tribe, religion, age, clan, family, red, white, yellow, black, orange, green, purple, fuchsia, silver, gold, neon pink, hey, you're all part of this hoop, a part of this sacred circle, and we all have a place and you all have a superpower, right? <laughs> so that's the basic teaching of this dance. What I'm gonna show you now as you're watching this dance, you're not watching me as a performer, but in fact, this is a very special traditional dance and it is an honor to be here to do this for you all today. What you're seeing, if you like what you see, if you see a tree, plant, flower, animal, or butterfly, I'm gonna ask for your support to give a hoop, a holler, or a hole wa, right? So this dance is a reflective dance to all the beautiful game changers, the art changers, and the makers uh, for the future out there. Does that make sense, everybody? Should we hoop it up? All right, I'm going to show you what this is. <laughs>
Hi, thank you. I've got one, one question for you. <laughs> yes. And many questions, but one that we're gonna just ask right now. Um, thinking about this term, who we be, right, from, from, from the title of Jeff's book, what does it mean to uh, merge what are the living traditions from your people with your social justice work and to form this sort of new way of being, merging those traditions as you do? Right. Whoa. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Some serious talking here. Um, <laughs> Well, to answer your question that was demonstrated, if you'll take a look at the images that's made, this globe of life, this hoop of life, right? The image that we're all interconnected, right? And the art that I make sort of being intersectional, also with my identity being uh, First Nations Indigenous, as well as um, Two-Spirit and, you know, working with the East Coast Two-Spirit Society in the Arts. What happens with this structure, as you saw depicted in the dance, right, is if you remove one hoop from this great gro globe, this great circle of life, you kind of fall apart, right? You fall down. And that's just, um, as we work, those things are gonna happen. That's the reality. But in my work, what I found is if you make strong connections with people, right? Links in a chain, right? You honor all living things. When those things happen, you can form paths, mm -hmm. right? To walk together. You have the choice as an individual to make those connections. And with that, as you saw, you can, um, create a strong uh, nest or foundation, right? An unbreakable hoop, an unbreakable circle. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank cool. you. Thank you. Okay. That's all the time we have for this question, but hopefully everyone will get a chance to ask everybody lots of questions at, uh, at, the, at the end. Um, thank you, Ty. Thank you. So. We have one more respondent, uh, and I'll bring them out in just a second. There's two of them. We've got Raquel Deanda and Gon Golan from the People's Climate Arts Collective. So, thank you. Wow. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ty, for setting the gold standard in terms of a hard act to follow. <laughs> Seriously. Um, <laughs> wow. Um, we're going to shift gears a little bit, but uh, I'll just hand it over to Raquel. Thanks. Um, hello. So my name is Raquel de Anda. I'm a curator uh, and a cultural producer and a community organizer who, for many years, has worked along issues of representation at the intersection of art and activism and with the Latino arts movement. This is an image of Galeria de la Raza, which was a gallery, which is a gallery in the Mission District of San Francisco, where I worked for seven years as an associate curator. Um, clicker. Uh, my name is Gon Golan. I'm an artist and activist, and I've worked <laughs> <laughs> at the intersection of um, visual art, performance, and mass mobilizations. Um, I also have a deep love of popular culture. Here's uh, two political satires I worked on. Uh, the left is about what happens to superheroes during the economic crisis. Um, and the one on the right is pretty much the destruction of your most beloved children's book, um, which to my great surprise made it onto the New York Times bestsellers list. So Gon and I form part of the People's Climate Arts Collective. Uh, PCA it has a core group of 12 artists activists that are stewards for the collective, and we have a network of over of hundreds of artists and activists. We developed in the lead up to the People's Climate March, which was last September, and um, the, it was the largest climate march in world history, with over 400,000 people participating, and one in which artists played a critical role in the development of the narrative for the march. The march was also really significant because it marked a shift in a conversation around environmental, the environmentalist movement to one of climate justice, which had frontline communities that are most affected by climate crisis at the leadership of this table. Yeah, and that's, oh, go back. Sorry. Uh, and that's really what we want to talk about today, which is the very crucial and important role that artists are playing in igniting, in sustaining, uh, in building social movements that are changing the conversation. 
Um, and uh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So we're currently living in a moment where social, social justice movements are surging. Yeah. Uh, we have the economic justice movement with Occupy, known as Occupy Wall Street, um, the anti-student debt movement, um, the immigration movement. Here we have dreamers dressed up in their graduation garbs in this, garbs in this incredibly effective moment of, of political theater. Um, we have the racial justice movement and Black Lives Matter. We're really living in a moment where, in over, that we haven't seen in over 40 years where, where social movements are surging. Yeah. And I think what's really important to recognize is that these, these engines of change are really, uh, the ones that are really shaping the conversation are emerging from outside of the existing professionalized nonprofit landscape that, and political parties that we've spent the last 20, 30, 40 years building. And um, there's this tendency, because they're kind of on the outside, to be a little bit dismissive. You know, they're disorganized. It's just about personal expression. They're random, chaotic, spontaneous. They don't have demands. You know, all these kind of narratives we see. And you all remember this happened a couple weeks ago. Um, and you know, the big question was, who, who won the debate? Was it Hillary? Was it Bernie? Was it Bernie? Was it Hillary? And I think the clear answer was social movements won the debate. When you look at the issues that they were forced to talk about, which five, ten years ago were absolutely taboo, from climate change being the greatest threat to national security, to Wall Street greed and economic inequality, to ra structural racism, to uh, needing a pathway to citizenship for 11 million undocumented immigrants, this is the work of social movements having forced themselves into these conversations and defining the electoral process and the policy agenda. Um, and art has played a huge role in these social movements. Just one small example of thousands. Um, I'm sure many of you recognize this image of the kind of iconic ballerina on the bull that was actually the first way that most people, I think, who participated in Occupy Wall Street came to know of this, uh, this upcoming attempt to Occupy Wall Street was actually this image. And we could go on at length about how the entire prefigurative imagination of that movement is in this image of a transcendent reality of beauty, a more humane reality conquering over kind of the violent force of capital. But it ignited people's imagination and inspired people to want to participate in this event. And all the subsequent movements since then have all of, have generated so much art movements as part of the work that they do. So art does many things for social, for social movements. Um, art acts as a catalyst for communities and individuals to articulate their narratives, both of struggle and of a vision of the world that they want to enact. This is um, an image of the shorefront communities in the Rockaways that were heavily affected by Hurricane Sandy and some of the artwork that they produced for the People's Climate March. Art also makes our demands legible to the public and the media um, in ways that can be incredibly effective. That last image actually made it to the cover of the New York Times. This image is an image from the Fight for 15 campaign, which um, was a campaign to raise the minimum wage to $15 in New York State, a campaign which we won. There's now 250,000 low-wage workers that will soon be making $15 an hour. And I think it's important to recognize what a game changer art has been uh, working within these movements. And I think there's a reason for that. And it's because artists see the problem differently. Artists think differently. And just as importantly, artists actually organize differently. The kinds of structures they build to do their work are very different than traditional organizing structures. Um, artists also, their critique tends to be more at the systemic level, looking at root causes and not just staying in the realm of policy or symptoms. Uh, when we brought this 300 foot long banner to flood Wall Street to try and link uh, the climate crisis to the financial sector, the fact that it was you know, every helicopter covering the event had to start talking about the word capitalism, something which is often taboo in, discuss uh, in discussions around climate change and, and the financial sector. Um, artists also tend to be, uh, I think, uh, very bold and uh, in the way that they communicate. And often their work is, again, very tied to forms of uh, direct action, direct confrontation with power, and really kind of speaking truth to power and saying what needs to be said. So what we found is that when you work through the arts, you have these moments 
that allow for intersectional narratives and conversations to emerge. Um, this is an, an image of a, solid, a solidarity campaign that we helped organize for families of the 43 disappeared students from Ayotzinapa, Mexico. And when, these, when the caravan arrived to New York City after stopping in 14 cities across the United States, we organized to develop not just a march, but also a series of programs with families who'd lost loved ones to police violence in New York City. And it was a moment where both of these communities could come together and articulate a narrative about police brutality and about state impunity across borders. And you know what this really boils down to for us is that art is not is, art is not a form of decoration. Art is an organizing strategy. And you know when we think about this, it really means bringing artists into the table from the very beginning. It means having them be at the table for the strategic organizing processes. It means baking them in from the very beginning, not just adding them as a cherry on top. Artists are not here to be brought in at the very end to paint a banner, to design a print, to write a song for your rally. It's really about having them do the hard work from the very beginning, and radically new things will happen. And here's a concrete example of how we do some of this work. This is um, <clears throat> a gathering at the Brooklyn Museum that we held in the lead up to the People's Climate March. It's, we call it the Sporatorium. It comes from the Greek word sporia, which means to grow and germinate seeds. We've had 12 gatherings across the city um, in over a year. And at these gatherings, artists and activists come from all across the city to get together and have conversations about the things that they're most concerned about. It's a place to build deep relationships and to take action on those relationships. And what this, you know, one of the things that we understand is that our, the most important artwork is not just what you see on the street, but the relations that, relationships that are built before, during, and after those moments. Um, and I think uh, what we have learned from doing this work, and again, it's nothing we've invented. I think we've rediscovered a lot of movement practices from previ previous generations. But um, that the best way to support uh, or let's say one of the most important ways we can support these very dynamic emerging movements is through the arts. And one of the most important ways we can support the arts is through building infrastructure. Infrastructure of a kind that we often don't have or don't focus enough on. And we specifically mean autonomous arts infrastructure. And the reason that autonomous part is so important is precisely because all of this change is coming from places that are outside of the existing infrastructure that we've created. And so, our and so that challenge, uh, so that infrastructure can look like all kinds of things, um, setting up artist spaces so that artists can work side by side, really developing those on the ground, authentic relationships with each other, but then working across movements, working across issues in a more permanent, ongoing way. Um, it can uh, mean training and capacity building so that the work of artists is more strategic, more integrated into the work that communities do, and of course, actual su uh, support for artists um, to do the work. So here's the good news. Um, as Jeff mentioned, we're living in an incredibly historic moment. Social movements are surging, and they need our art, they need your art, and our call is really to try and fund and su to support autonomous arts-based organizations that are led by artists, that are driven by artists, that are spaces where multiple social movements can be sourced and strengthened. To change everything, we need everyone, is what we say in the climate justice movement. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So, two of us. <laughs> can you say, we talked about this a bit earlier, can you say a bit more about what kind of um, structural changes would have to be made to support autonomous arts groups because you're not a 501c3, you're, you're not an organization, you're a collective, and you're not eligible for funding. So yeah. what are some thoughts around what sort of things artists who engage in this organizing work need and how, what would have to change yeah. to make it easier? Yeah, I think traditional structures are set up so that you need a 501c3, and we actually have fiscal sponsorship, and that's doable. But I think, you know, as the city is thinking through a cultural plan and ways of really supporting artists in this moment where we're trying to drive equity forward, right. I think it's really important to maybe consider ways in which we can develop pots of, of money for autonomous arts-based organizations that don't require having to go through all of these um, administrative hurdles in order to make sure that you get the money because mm -hmm. artists are really spread thin and having to go through all those hurdles is exhaustive. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. yes. And, yeah. and just to put a, like a concept on, around that is like we're really talking about 
trying to build a commons, right? A commons that ser can serve multiple communities, uh, multiple artists, multiple projects at the same time. So it's not just about you know, s funding specific organizations and getting into the kind of competitive nature of funding, but how can we come together to create infrastructure and resources that is available to a much wider landscape of participants? Thank you, yes, right. absolutely. Thank you both. Thanks. Lots right. of yes, have a hand. <laughs> We've covered lots of great ideas today, and uh, I encourage you to reach out to all of the respondents with further questions. This end point is a very important one, what kind of structural support can be created. Um, but we have to move to the next part of, the, of our day. So thank you guys, thank both yeah. of you. Thank you. Um, thank you. I am I'm sorry. Now I'm going to bring on Teddy Cruz, who's an architect and professor of public culture and urbanism at UC San Diego. And he's going to introduce lunchtime and the breakout sessions. Thanks, you all. Everyone have a great rest of the day. Thank yes, yes, thank you. Yes, I, uh, we know that we are running a, a little late, but the good thing is that we're going to have lunch around really compelling discussions. And so I just wanted to quickly introduce the sessions. But before saying that, a, a, a couple of things about that I wanted to say, you know, as a Guatemalan immigrant, I'm extremely proud of being part of Arts in the Change in America. And I want to really thank Roberta Uno for her support in making me part of this project. I just wanted to also frame a couple of thoughts about the sessions. Obviously, we all know that critical issues change in America and the world, ranging from inequality to climate change to the issues that really bring us together today here, the kind of sociopolitical relations that will be impacted by demo demographic change demand institutional transformations and demand uh, different ways of thinking and doing. I think in the context of that promise, arts and culture become engines, truly engines, for producing new forms of community and civic engagement. That means producing a new public imagination, a new, a new kind of public culture that can take us beyond the American dream as defined just as a private dream, devoid of any social responsibility, and in fact, embedded in what Jeff reminded us so beautifully today, in a kind of radical diversity in, in plural democracy. Uh, I wanted to also say that as arts and culture are central uh, to this, it's also important to imagine that we as artists and cultural producers need to be self-critical and really retool ourselves transform our own methods and strategies for intervention in the debate and in, 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 the, in the construction of social justice. So that's what the sessions are about, is bringing a group of artists and cultural producers who in fact uh, are uh, reimagining strategies to engage many of the issues that were uh, shared uh, this morning. So uh, each of uh, the sessions will be introduced uh, by uh, some of the participants. And uh, let's begin with uh, the first one. Uh, hello. So I, I come here literally straight from St. Louis, having uh, participated with um, hundreds of artists from around the country and in St. Louis, um, producing theater about Black Lives Matter and uh, the plays being done again today in um, uh, uh, Rhode Island. And I'm just reminded more and more and more and more about how important this work is. Nicole Salter, one of our playwrights, said that we have to change hearts, not laws, because because laws can be changed. They can be rewritten, right? And laws are just rules to the game. And I know that right now we ain't playing because this is about black lives, this is about our lives. So our session is going to be including uh, theater artist Christina Del Calhoun, um, uh, inter interdisciplinary artist Ebony Noel Golden. It's moderated by Carlton Turter. It's called The Ferguson Moment. And I hope you will join us for this very important work. And my name is Claudia Alec from the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Uh, hi, I'm Marisa Chivas. Hola, mi gente. I am so proud to be here today. So our, um, our session is Language is Cultural and Change. Uh, I'm going to be speaking, uh, as well as Annette Evans-Smith. We're going to be talking about how, in our work, our languages are central as activists, as artists. Uh, we're also going to be talking about uh, the urgent need to keep our languages alive. We're going to be uh, asking and bringing in a conversation and talking about uh, 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 how, how important it is for us to keep our languages alive. And uh, please join us. Yes.
Thank you, everyone. Um, we will be flipping the conversation about immigration with two of the really compelling voices, Jose Antonio Vargas, um, prize-winning journalist, and Beatriz Cortez, who are um, really going to be addressing the questions of immigration across different sectors and how the time has come to uh, reverse some of the assumptions, metaphors, and some of the ways in which this um, critical issue at the heart of changing demographics is affecting us today in a beautiful section called Migration is Beautiful. So please come join us. I'm Maribel Alvarez, and I will be the facilitator. Hi, everyone. Oops. Uh, my name is Alison Akucho Gordon. Um, I'm Inupiaq from the Arctic, and our session is called Our Environment, Our Planet uh, with Nora Navajo Moore, if she's here. Should, there she is. Um, we are both indigenous women who work, um, I mean, for myself, uh, uh, climate change is one of the, the biggest issues that I work with, and she does work with clay, and she has these beautiful images. We had a, I was in Iceland at the Arctic Circle meeting, and we had a pre-planning call, and it was, uh, it was just such an amazing um, pre-planning planning call for this. <laughs> so we're excited to continue that, that conversation, and um, a polar bear is gonna actually show up in the performance, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the panel. <laughs> Good afternoon. Oh, Marlene, one more. Hi. You thought you were going to skip me. Uh, my name is Marlene Ramirez Cancio, and I just want to say first that I love how Art Change Us is like this delicious invocation. Like, Art Change Us, like Art Aluja, you know, as Reverend Billy might say. So um, our session is a, a new institutional map, and we're at an institution that recently put out a challenge uh, to tackle inequality. And we're going to be uh, hearing from two women who are leaders in their field, Shade Lithcott, CEO of the National Black Theater, and Anne Pasternak, the director of the Brooklyn Museum. And I mean, these badass women are heading up institutions that have been working with uh, demographic change for a long time. Uh, they don't often get to be in the same room with one another, a theater and a museum. So this is your chance to hear them talk about in a frank and honest way around not diversity around institutions the way they do to look good on paper, but really around uh, actual equity and social change to what it's like to build an ecosystem uh, that uh, it requires cultural competence all around to create actual change. So this is a no YouTubing of the conversation, no audio recording. You know, we want to be blunt and frank, so come and join us. <laughs> Try this again. <laughs> Two microphones. Um, good afternoon. <laughs> I'm Kristen Adele Calhoun, and I'm the program director for Arts in a Changing America. <laughs> Thank you. As Roberta mentioned, one of our core values is leading with artists, leading with the arts, and our entire team is comprised of people who have a working artistic practice. I work here in the city as an actress. I'm also co-writing a play about Ferguson called Canfield Drive. I'll be on the panel about Ferguson that Claudia introduced, and that is being written through a commission with the National Performance Network, 651 Arts here in Brooklyn, and the St. Louis Black Rep. Roberta also, incredibly, has a very vibrant artistic practice, and today we are featuring a piece that she is co-writing with the amazing Martha Redbone and the multi-talented Aaron Whitby, who are the composers of the music and the co-writers of the book of Bone Hill. So the pieces that we've selected for you to hear today are called Census Man and One Drop, and we've selected them because they really highlight the ways in which race is shaped by policy and also so social customs. So without further ado, I give you the Martha Redbone Band. Move. 
Cause you black people who can usher you up to the 11th floor. The two elevators, the freight elevator and the one on the far left are being held for people to go upstairs. And like I said, lunch is ready and in the room, so go have a great breakout session.